please provide a warm welcome to KP Singh. Hello everyone, I'm KP Singh. I work for Google in Zurich. I'm responsible for security detection and response on Linux machines. Today we are going to talk about the background and motivation behind developing security eBPF programs or LSM programs as they're called and how you could use them to build the next generation of security products. Let's start with the story of how it all began. And just to make it a little fun, it'll be a comic. A long, long time ago, actually not that long back, it was in 2019. It does feel like a long time back though. A security analyst came up to me and said, Hey, I need some audit data. I told them, can't you just use audit? They said, nah, audit does not have the data I need. I, I think this was about audit logging environment variables. So I thought to myself, how hard could it be? I patched audit in the kernel. I updated the audit CTL and the user space policy language. And before I could finish, they came up to me and said, mm, I want to use this data to prevent some user actions. And reality struck. We cannot do enforcement with audit. So I had to do the same thing again for Linux security modules, like updating the kernel and the user space components and the policy language of SE Linux or AppArmor. Turns out these LSMs or Linux security modules are not very modular after all. So I told them and my boss, it's easy. We just need a new way to do security in Linux. And they said, yeah, sure. Do it. It did not take me long to realize that BPF had been solving similar problems in other areas and it was about time to introduce BPF to security. And after extensive discussion on the kernel mailing list, another Linux security module which could be implemented at runtime using eBPF programs was born. Security can be broadly classified into two approaches which work hand in hand. Monitoring what is happening on a system and enforcement, which means taking action based on the monitored data. Prior to PPF, one could monitor using Linux audit, perf and trace points, or build custom kernel modules with things like k-probes. An enforcement could be done using Linux security modules like SE Linux or AppArmor, or do sandboxing using SecComp. The BPF LSM sits comfortably in the middle, providing a unified and flexible way to do both enforcement and monitoring. So, how does it work? There are around 200 LSM hooks. These LSM hooks are a layer of abstraction higher than the system call API. For example, one can execute a process using execve and execve add, but they both call the same set of LSM hooks. These hooks correspond to changes in kernel objects and are placed strategically in the lifecycle of the object and the ongoing operation so that you have the right data to make the decision you need to make. Example, actions like an inode being unlinked, which is just fancy speak for a file being deleted, a socket being opened, or a binary executing all go via the LSM framework. So the LSMs can make decisions like allowing the execution of a binary or de denying the deletion of a file. The BPF LSM can happily coexist with the other LSMs like SE Linux and AppArmor and does not need to do anything by default. One can load an LSM eBPF program to, provi to provide custom logic for the LSM hook. In this example, the BPF LSM hook for process execution gets invoked after all the other LSMs. 
this order can be changed on the kernel command line. PPF programs need to be verified so that they only read valid fields of the various struct arguments and not arbitrary offsets into the context pointer. Modern kernels have BTF information, which is a condensed form of dwarf information and has information about the structures and the respective runtime offsets of, the, of its members and the signature of the functions that are defined in the kernel. Using this information, the verifier is able to check whether the accesses that are made in the BPF program are allowed because it knows the signature of the LSM hook and the types of its arguments. The verified program is then just in time compiled to native code and from this time onwards, it is no different from another LSM hook. This LSM hook can then write audit data back to user space using ring buffers and maps and also make enforcement decisions. Show me the code. <laughs> Let's have a look at an eBPF program that audits process executions. The first step is to define a struct or the data format which will be used by eBPF program and also by user space. We attach the eBPF program to the LSM hook called PPRM committed creds. Although this hook is terribly named, it signifies a key state during the execution of a process. Let's talk a bit about that PPF prog macro. The BPF programs typically get a single pointer as their context. For example, this could be a socket pointer for networking programs. But there is no single pointer for tracing an LSM programs that can be used as a context. So the programs are invoked with an array of integer pointers, which contain the arguments that are passed to the attached function. The BPF prog macro simplifies the definition of these programs by deconstructing or unmarshalling this array into these respective arguments. The next step is to reserve some space on the BPF ring buffer for the data that needs to be shown or written to user space. One can now call PPF helpers to get the information and thanks to BTF also read some information directly passed uh, to, the, uh, to the arguments. In this case, we read the current PID using a BPF helper. Finally, the event is submitted to user space. The user space can then use the poll API to process this data further. LSM programs can also be used to do stateful detections by annotating kernel objects using security blobs, which are made available to BPF programs as BPF local storage. The LSM blobs allocated have the same life cycle as the owning object, and are freed with the object, which makes it easier to maintain than conventional BPF maps. In this example, a security blob is set on the task struct with a pointer to the inode of the executable. The information can then be used in the inode unlink LSM hook, which is called when a file is being deleted to check whether an executable is trying to delete itself. The LSM program can then choose to deny this action or log an event to user space as a warning. One can further set security blobs as a part of a more complicated multi-state detection. Let's have a quick look at the code. Do note that this is based on my upcoming patch series for task local storage, but works similarly for the already available inode and socket local storage. This defines the task storage map with an element of type struct local storage, which contains the pointer to the inode of the executable. The map is merely used as a key to identify the program setting the storage, its type and the size. The actual storage is still owned by the object that is the task struct and not by this map. We then set the storage on the BPRM committed creds LSM hook. Note that we are reading directly from struct BPRM here. This is possible thanks to BTF. We then retrieve the storage from the current task 
and compare the value of the inode to that being to that being deleted and return a permission error when they are the same again a slight warning here the bpf get current task btf is also a part of my task local storage path series Let's have a look at some of the recent updates and the upcoming features relevant for LSM programs. A new BPF ring buffer was merged into the kernel to overcome some of the limitations of the perf ring buffer. We found this very useful for LSM BPF programs. The patches for BPF D path helper have been merged. This helper can be used to get the path of a directory entry from a BPF program. This means that you can get the path of the binary being executed or the file being deleted or opened. We already have task local we already have local storage for inodes and sockets and the patches for task security blobs or local storage should be on the list soon. Hopefully they will be already on the list by the time you hear hear this presentation. Some of the LSM hooks need to read user memory. The most notable and notorious example of this is reading the arguments of a process. Since the data can be paged out, the BPF programs may need to sleep in order for the kernel to page the data in. Prior to sleepable BPF, this was not possible. Thanks to the work done by Alexei and Paul McKenney, it is now possible to do this in sleepable versions of LSM and tracing programs with the BPF copy from user helper. Loading LF LSM programs at boot time. This is helpful when you want the task local storage to be set on kernel objects really early on in the boot time. The support for this has also been merged with the user mode helper BPF programs. Atomic operations. My colleague Brendan is working on adding atomic operations to the BPF instruction set to implement operations starting with the atomic fetch and add instruction. Advanced string helpers to, to handle data like argument vectors and file paths. We've not started work on this yet. We need more helpers to process the strings that we can now gather with the BPF dpath helper and the sleepable BPF. At Google, we use custom patches to dump process arguments onto the ring buffer but these need to be generalized. So there is, there is some work to be done here. Some final thoughts. Our vision is to empower the security analysts to leverage the years of research done on LSM hooks and implement detections and auditing using eBPF without needing to worry about patching the kernel or rebooting the whole Linux fleet. I do think that BPF LSM won't replace more advanced LSMs like SE Linux or App Armor, at least in the near future. But it'll happily coexist with other LSMs and learn from them. Thank you so much for listening, and now it's time for questions. Thank you, KP. And we also we already have several questions popping in. To kick it off, I actually really like the, the comment from Miles, KP bringing the fire to his boss. <laughs> and that, that, very funny. Uh, first question is from Roberto. Can LSM BPF delay instead of denying the deletion of a file? In other words, can it block the process calling the unlink signal? So the, as of now, I don't think so. Uh, I do think that one could add a BPF helper that just delays the execution of uh, in, in the BPF, uh, you could add a delay. We haven't thought of that use case, but we could discuss it more on the on the mailing list or or in the Slack channels as well. Okay. Then Yonif is asking, are there any new eBPF helpers to extract data from the LSM hooks arguments? Uh, extract full five, for example, extract full five file path from the file struct without parsing the kernel structures. Uh, I think this is what I what I mentioned in the talk as well that we have the BPF D path helper, 
and thanks to Jiri uh, who's done some awesome work here. We need to enable it for some of the LSM hooks. Uh, there, I think I'll be sending a patch. Uh, I or Flora will be sending a patch very soon. But they're already available for tracing, and we just need to send a couple of lines of change, which enables it for KRSI or PPF LSM. By the way, I don't talk that slow that I talked in the presentation normally, so I'm a bit fast uh, when I talk generally. Sorry for the mismatch. <laughs> I think it was actually very, very easy to understand that way. John is asking, what is a good way or place to get started with KRSI? So this is an interesting question. What we realized is the, the ramp up going into BPF is pretty hard. Uh, we do have the eBPF uh, site that helps a lot, but we also doing, uh, and this is like really work in progress, but there is a project on GitHub we've started, which has some documentation on how you could start with LSM programs and how you could gather data. I will post the link in the chat. But again, this was an intern's work over us over the over summer, and we would encourage actually some uh, a build build up on that project, and we'd also be contributing actively there. So the goal is like, if you don't know anything about KRSI or VPF LSM, how could you build a user space application uh, and and deploy it on your system? And then Gavin is asking, as of today, to load eBPF programs at boot time, can you just load them via a systemd unit? I, I'm, I'm not sure of uh, I'm not sure of that. Maybe you could do that in the system D as well. But sometimes you actually want it to be done even before that because what you're doing is you're setting these annotations or blobs on kernel objects, and then you want to do it as early as possible in the boot process. So this new BPF user mode helper stuff that was added uh, actually enables uh, that use case. If the system D is early enough for you, I think you should be able to do that in system D as well. Excellent. Then Tristan is asking, do these LSM BPF programs still need a user space program to keep them alive? So last I checked, no, you can pin BPF programs and you can keep them alive by pinning them on BPFFS. So we, we actually had this use case as well. So thanks to somebody who implemented it. And then the last question before we run out of time, Swarm is asking, can LSM hooks be theoretically used to monitor modification of user space memory from BPF programs. It's a method that can be used to create a stager for, mal for malware. I think it's an interesting use case. I, I, I don't know whether that is possible. Maybe some, uh, some complicated memory hashing scheme where you could read memory hashing. FS Verity, but that is not really user space memory. I, I can't think of something on the top of my head that would answer this. OK. But go. Please feel free to extend stuff and send us patches. <laughs> yeah, I think definitely a very interesting idea. So again, KP, thanks a lot for a fantastic talk. Please give a big round of applause to KP.